Hey everybody, I'm Tim Burnett, and this is the Solo Hunter Podcast. We're talking hunting and adventure, business and life with other self-sufficient and like-minded individuals. This is podcast episode number 14 with my good friend Wayne Comstock of Nevada Taxidermy. You know, my grandfather and my grandmother joked around when I was little, oh, you can you know, wind up being a taxidermist, and I'm like, no, because I wouldn't want to yeah. give it back to the person. Do you but, have a hard time with that now? No. No, I love looking at it. I just wondered, because there's a lot of my heads you've had for like five, six years. Well, good work takes time. That's what I tell all my guys, you know. I always tell guys, take care of your hide like you do your meat. So what's a giant for a mountain grizzly? A legit nine. Now you look at what the muddies are producing, and right. you're just like, holy mackerel, they're killing tanks, you know. I go, do you want, you want to take my truck? He's like, yeah, let's take your truck. I think he knew why, because those roads, <laughs> I mean, it's like, <laughs> Pinstriping. <laughs> just destroyed the sides of my truck. I'm like, you sucker. When we draw a deer tag or whatever, we just go and we hunt a deer. Yeah, you know, that's a nice buck whack. Over in Africa, it's, it's different. Maybe a base camp or a trailer or a lodge wouldn't be so bad. They're not bad either. <laughs> Done them. They're, they're cool. <laughs> Do we need to slap, slap Wayne? No, we're good. I didn't think so. <laughs> This ought to be interesting. We have the peanut gallery on either side of us. Yes. They can hear us, but we really can't hear them, so that's not fair. No. <laughs> I have to pull off this earpiece to be able to hear what's being said. <laughs> I don't know if I want that or not. <laughs> so here at uh, Nevada Taxidermy, Wayne's been doing my stuff for quite a long time. Well, when I do get lucky enough to bring something in anyway. In following you on Instagram, like you get a lot of really good interaction by people, so I know people are kind of fascinated by taxidermy. Just go ahead and kind of introduce yourself and, and fire away. Well, I've been doing taxidermy started when I was 12 years old. My grandparents took me to a taxidermy show in Fallon. It was at the MBU dinner. They used to, back in the 90s, they used to have a, th it was about a three or four day show. And all the taxidermists would come and bring their stuff. And you would, uh, you know, that was open to the public. And then they had their fundraiser. It was like uh, Friday night. And there was a crab feed. I think they still have the crab feed. Well, my grandparents surprised me. They took me to Fallon. We were going to go photograph ducks. And they took me to the show first. And needless to say, it was uh, we didn't leave for hours. I was totally intrigued with everything that was going on. And uh, met Norm Sakey. He was the biologist for waterfowl in Fallon at the time and uh norman and i hit it off and he kind of he'd give me little tidbits here and there and the rest is history i've been doing taxidermy ever since it started with birds huh. and then after that we went into big game and haven't looked back now we mainly do uh life size that's what 90 percent of our business is life size and custom pieces we do we do a fair amount of uh shoulder mounts but you know, it's, it's majority is life size and just, you know, stuff that not everybody has. Mm -hmm. You know, guys that come to us, you know, they're they're looking for something a little bit different. And that's what we specialize in. We just kind of found our niche. Mm -hmm. It was kind of weird before the crash, of the economy, the it was shoulder mounts. So what we did and we do we do a ton of them because those are just churn and burn. You can yep. just roll them in, just, roll them out. Yep. And then the crash hit. You know, and it just the biz business died, and we just ca had enough to just barely make it. And then after the economy started coming back, it just shifted gears, and we started getting the life size and doing mountains and big dioramas, and and that's the way it's been ever since. The the shoulder mounts we still do a fair number of shoulder mounts, but it's by far. It's the life size that's what we're hmm. what we do. Yeah, I think when I first met you, we were doing a video, and you you took me to somebody's home here mm -hmm. here in town, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that really struck me was like this guy. Of course, if you can do it, you can do it. You can afford it, but just the like you literally had a mountain in the middle of his room, mm -hmm. and then all the I don't think there was a single. There might have been a few just basic shoulder mounts everything else had a scenery to it mm -hmm. or a scene um some background some rock work or whatever else and you had done all of that and mm -hmm. that was one thing that i was like wow there's so much more possibility with taxidermy than mm -hmm. to just stuff ahead and put it right. on a wall you know yeah it's the sky's the limit it's yeah. just 
is what do you want in your house? I mean, even with the shoulder mount, people are doing like wall pedestals, mm -hmm. which really gives it a nice look because instead of just a head stuck on the wall, you can put a little bit of rock and a um, small tree or whatever mm -hmm. behind it, and it doesn't take up any more room than what a shoulder mount would do. You know, because not everybody has huge game rooms just allotted to put all their their fun stuff in there Huge. So. It's a, it's, it wasn't i don't think this was a game room i think this was a a wing of the house that this guy had yes it was incredible yep you know my grandfather and my grandmother joked around when i was little oh you you know, wind up being a taxidermist and i'm like no because i wouldn't want to give it back to the person <laughs> you know yeah so um do you but, have a hard time with that now no no nope. i love looking at it um but it i don't have a problem I just I just wondered because there's a lot of my heads you've had for like five six years. Well, good work takes time. That's what right? I tell all my yeah. guys. You know, <laughs> the problem is is like well, not the problem. Like, I don't have anywhere to put it. I know <laughs> my, house, my house is full of uh, kids' toys and stuff. You know, and well, my wife, she, we have one mountain in the house, and you know which one that is. Mm -hmm. It's the moose. Oh, you moved it out of your office and yeah the that was a that was a project to move that out of the office so wayne wayne and uh sabrina came out to my house and hung that in my office and it took up like a third of my office you know yep so when was it this has been about a year ago about a yeah. year ago christmas yeah. time yep we had a new neighbor move across the street jason and um i was like hey, i'm gonna grab jason and my neighbor tim and we'll just move that thing out of the garage or out of my my garage office my office and put it ab above the door. So now it's right above the front door. Man, that was not easy to move that thing in there. I had, not light. I had two, the, the two big ladders on the side. And I thought, there's three of us, man. This, this is no problem. So I had two ladders and then a stool in the middle for somebody to kind of balance it. And I might as well have had two girls helping me <laughs> into my neighbor. The, I'm only kidding, but like... <laughs> I think they're afraid to grab it, like really just get a hold of it and latch onto it. And Tim, I think, to his defense, which he'll listen to this, I know he will, because he's he's a good guy. We talk about things all the time, but he's he had a shoulder problem or something. And I think Jason, we he's a he's a CrossFit kind of guy. I think we just hamstrung him and put him on the short ladder. <laughs> so he was he was crippled to begin with. Um, but yeah, I finally just grabbed that thing and horsed it up there and and put it on there, knowing that as soon as it was on the nail, I could let go and fall and be okay. And we got it on that hook, and it's still there. Like my wife is, I think, is paranoid to this day that the moose is going to fall on her head. So <laughs> don't walk under it. Don't <laughs> let your kids go underneath yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's awesome. I love it in there. It's really cool. It fills up that entire that entire front entryway. So that uh, uh, is a beautiful bowl. Yeah. I mean, I, that's on my to-do list. The moose? The, uh, I want to get a moose, uh -huh. definitely. I think you should. Yeah. I have I have friends now. Oh, I have a you? good friend in Alaska, that uh, Justin Schaefer, uh -huh. and uh, he lives up in Alaska, and we're working on that. I told him, I go, that's on the to-do list. Right. Along that, with muskox. <laughs> can you, now muskox, you have to draw that up there, or can you? Um, I believe so. There's there's a couple options he was looking into for me, mm -hmm. so um, we're still he's still piecing that together for me. But yeah, he drew I believe he drew the tag. I think there's a there's a limited draw area mm -hmm. for non-residents or something, and then there's something for the residents that they can. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know Maybe all it's this. A draw too. I don't. The uh, he was telling me there's a deal with uh, like on native land, um, you don't get the meat, but. You pay them, and you can hunt, and you give them the meat, and then you can keep the hide and, and the horns. So um, I don't know all the um, all the nitty-gritty on, on on that, but uh, he's looking that, it, it, looking into it for me cool. so I could go get a musk ox anyway. So. Yeah, there's a few things in Alaska. Like, that's the one thing that kind of – it's probably good because there's probably a lot of people that had run into trouble up there, but, like, you have to have a guide to go hunt certain animals mm -hmm. and it's like it's frustration for myself because i'm kind of a do-it-yourself or i want to i want to have the satisfaction of going and, and hunting something on my own but um i think moose black bear caribou mm -hmm. those are the only things you can do without a guide i think isn't it unless uh, you have i've next to kin or something like I that i believe so i've been out of the loop for the the um hunting up there for a while so I'm yeah. just getting where I'm getting back into it and um 
No, I'm getting. Ex I'm. Ex I'm excited about it. We're going to be going back up there this uh, June, mm -hmm. and we're going to be hunting black bears. Cool. Where are you going to go? Do you know or? Um, we're. Where I'm not sure exactly. Coordinates. I need coordinates. Yeah. From your, from your buddy. <laughs> yeah, I'll give it to you. I'll, I'll have a GPS tracker. I want to go this spring as well. I was planning, trying to line something out with my brother Boyd to go up there. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. Hopefully it all works out. We're going to be up there first part of June. And they had a, last year they had an incredible year. They, yeah. they, he shot a giant grizzly. Being he's resident, he don't need a guide. So. No, can they kill one every year? A grizzly I don't year? know. I, I don't know if he can or not. He might be able to. I'm not sure. Where he was at is Mountain Grizzly. So, and he shot a giant. But so what's a giant for a Mountain Grizzly? I, I believe he was a legit nine. You're kidding. Nine footer. Cause I believe that's what he squared out at. So a lot of those Mountain Grizzlies that people kill are seven. Mm -hmm. eight, you know, in yeah, the sevens, high yeah. sixes or sevens. Even though the pictures make them look a lot different, right? Now, the uh, average for brown bear coming from the fishing game up there seven and a half foot. That's the average brown bear. Brown bear, Alaskan brown wow. bear. Wow, you would not think that by looking through magazines or mm -mm. seeing what what's out there. No, you wouldn't. You know, everybody wants that ten footer, you know. Right, because they're there. Right, they're there, but they're so far and few between. Yeah. You know, be like shooting a legit 36 inch muley you know it just well, doesn't happen very often <laughs> yeah every photo i see you see of a bear what no matter what it is it's it's you know profile on a log or something and the, and somebody's sitting back behind it and i think a lot of that has to do with your first reaction when i killed my first bear of course i was a kid you know i think i was 19 or 20 or something like that like, it was big. It was a legit 350-pound mountain bear, big bear. And so I just associated every bear as big bear. So then I go to Canada with some buddies. I went to, um, it was uh, New Brunswick. Okay. And this bear strolls in. I smack it and uh, get up to it. I'm like, daggum, this, is a, this isn't very big, you know. Um, and I think that's common. I think I think bears are so hard to judge, but... People think, oh, bears are gigantic. They're really, there's there are gigantic ones, but not like you say, they're not not very common. Right. It's yeah. It's you know, been doing taxidermy a long time, and it's the biggest thing. People will bring a bear in, you put them together, and they're well. I thought he was bigger than that. Like anymore, I'll take people and show them. We'll st stretch the hide out. While it's there. And, we're, you know, while they have them come into the shop just to show them that, mm -hmm. hey, you killed a good bear. You killed a really nice bear. But it's not <laughs> what you think it's not the in thing. your head, you know. So um, yeah. that's kind of yeah, all taxidermists. I think any 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 taxidermist out there that's been doing it a while, mm -hmm. that's the biggest complaint with bears from their clients is, oh, I, I thought it was bigger. Hmm. I've only had one guy go, well, it's – Bigger than I thought. <laughs> and that bear I mounted a few years ago, and I about fell over when he said, I've never had a guy say, well, I was that, thought it was a little smaller than that. Let me guess. Was that Jason Peak? Nope. No. Nope. God, his bear was a tank, oh. wasn't it? Jason, Jason, when he saw his bear for the first time, he literally was speechless. I'll bet. He walked in, and he just looked at it. And he just, huge, huge black bear. Yeah, out of California. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jason's a good dude. I need to get him on the podcast. We got a little bit of history. Mm -hmm. but that bear was awesome and then did he he ended up mounting it with over that a, doe over a, a uh, it was a small buck was a small that, that he killed with his bow and arrow mm. and he uh i don't believe he was originally going to mount the deer but then when he killed that big bear you know we're going back a few years but mm -hmm. he uh wanted to do something real cool so we wound up doing the deer dead like the bear either killed it or come across it or whatever and the bear just kind of walking up to it and yeah. it come out really really cool and it's on a big pedestal thing it's a huge piece yeah it's awesome it fills up the back of a truck <laughs> <laughs> well that bear man that bear was huge it's that that one is the uh, largest black bear i've ever put together yeah huh i went out with him a couple weeks before he killed that bear we went up with that uh with that guy up in california and drove around and he's like i go do you want, do you want to take my truck he's like yeah, let's take your truck. I think he knew why, because those roads, <laughs> I mean, it's like, 
<laughs> pinstriping. <laughs> just destroyed the sides of my truck. I'm like, you sucker, you knew what was going on up here. You, so, but it was, it was good. Um, I got to get back together with Jason. It's been a, it's been a while. We used to have office space right across mm-hmm. the street from each other, and that's how we kind of met several years ago. But well, he was on this hunt with this ram that we're <clears throat> have. What's this sit- right here in front of us? Yep, the desert ram. My uh, <coughs> oh, that's Eric. Uh, it's my dentist. Yep. I was thinking it was Jason's other buddy Eric. When I saw him posted, I was thinking of a different Eric. Okay, but this is your your dentist shot this one. Yep. Where's the head? Right here. This is the ramp that they got. Oh, that's the brains you're picking out? Yeah, we got to get it all cleaned up, and we're uh, going to send it off to the beetles and get it all beetled and horns popped off and put back on. So let's talk about that for a second because um, I know a lot of guys will sweat it mm-hmm. and pop them off. What's what's the difference between sweating it and beetles? Well, the, actually – they do they they'll sweat it to pop them off but then instead of boiling them i have a guy here that's locally that has his own colony of beetles so it's just easier to to let them take care of it it doesn't ter- deteriorate the bone as much cooking them as long because mm-hmm. the beetles they get everything and it's just it's just easier so you're doing that after you actually sweat it and pop the horns yeah, off yeah well, i have him do it he he takes he takes care of all of that and so mm-hmm. all my sheep, I matter of fact, all the deer, everything, I just have him beetle them all. Even if it's just a shoulder mount, mm-hmm. I just, it's just, it's cleaner. Mm-hmm. There's n- literally nothing left, and I don't have to boil them. And boil them's never good. Oh, you don't want to. it stinks, wanna, too. It's just, yeah. Oh, it, it's, it's, it's a stinky job. Like this, our shop right now is just in utter chaos with all the skinning that's been going on. And I was going to say there's a crate out the door. That was a life-size moose that just rolled in. I don't. Unfortunately, I don't have the. I saw the rack on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. that thing was huge. Seventy-one inch bull. Yeah, he was a monster. Yeah, it, um, my buddy. He's actually a good friend of mine, Bill, and he he killed that bull this last. Uh, this wild August. Wild Bill or Junior or Wild Bill Senior? Junior. Ah. And uh, he called me right after he killed it, and uh, he was just ecstatic. Because you didn't, you don't go expecting to shoot a seventy-one inch right. bull moose. You're yeah. hoping for a sixty. You know that's the big. Sixty's big, a big moose. Mine was huge. sixty. That's a huge moose. It's huge, um, and they saw tons of moose. Had a gr- great hunt, and I don't remember the guy's name that he hunted with up there in Alaska, but it was he. It was an amazing, amazing trip. He loved it. Good for him. He does. He deserves it. So this sheep. Um, what did this one end up scoring? Did you guys I, tape it? I believe he was like one forty three. Is this a is this a pretty common size for that area? Yeah, the area they it? were in. This is pretty much what you're going to be getting. It was, yeah. I believe, the area was right out of Hawthorne. Sure, I believe it this was. This is this looks like most of the sheep that I see in the. I mean, I had the desert U tag down in in two thirteen, just north of Tonopah, so that would be south okay. east of Hawthorne. Um, and there were several rams in there about that size. Yeah. That, well, the year I had my tag um, for the muddies, the muddies at that time, they just weren't killing big rams out of it. I mean, there was a few good rams in there. But, mm. well, let me rephrase that. Any ram's a good ram. You bust your butt for them. So I don't well, care that, how big he is. That's <laughs> why I was curious because I'm looking at this saying, you know, I I don't know if I could pass that sheet. No. You know? no, I'd be tickled to death. I'd put plenty of these on my wall if yeah. I could. Yeah, no kidding. But uh, no, it uh, the year I had my tag, it w- I killed a 151. It was right in the middle. There was tw- I believe 12 rams taken. The biggest ram was 160. Hmm. Now you look at what the muddies are producing, and right. you're just like, holy mackerel! They're killing tanks, you know. Yeah. But I love my I love my ram. So <laughs> yeah, there's so much about like yeah. I don't even put in for the areas down there just because I don't want to deal with, um, I think, the pressure. So those areas that are producing the biggest sheep or the biggest deer or whatever else, they get the most pressure by the outfitters and the guides or the the governor's tags or whatever else. And there's not one sheep on the mountain that hasn't had eyes laid on it at one point in time. Mm -hmm. And if you come across, like Remy and I were talking about this, he, he kind of experienced this on his California sheep. Um, here in Nevada, 
to where he found the biggest sheep in the area. Well, so did the guides, so did the outfitters, you know. And so a couple of days before season or the day before season opened, it's just you have a, a trailer park full of people in there anticipating to hunt that ram and kill that ram and just kind of pushed Remy out of the area. So he was lucky to be able to get it, get it later on. But, like, that's just stuff that I don't want to deal with. You know, I would rather go to maybe not as popular of an area, know that I'm not going to have to deal with as many people. Maybe there's fewer tags were issued to that area. You might not kill as big of a sheep, but that's the experience that I want. I don't want the experience to be a stressful one no. or to be upset where it's like, man, I found that sheep and somebody shot it out from under me. Like when I was hunting up in the, the East Humboldt's, um, Mike McKinney. Mike McKinnon, McKinnon, I think, he packed Jason and I in on mules. Mm -hmm. um, Jason Peak, who we were talking about, just killed that that bear. He packed us in on mules and then packed out. Well, a couple of years before, they had um, they killed that great big Rocky up up in that area, and he said there was another group coming from the other side that was trying to get out from underneath them and shoot the shoot the ram out from under them and different things. And it just sounded like it was super super stressful for the guy that that was hunting it, you right. know? And I'm like, I, I would rather not shoot the, the biggest one. And I know other people probably think that I'm crazy. I'd be like, nah, I'd do whatever it takes to kill the biggest one, you know, but. I'm not into that. Because then, you're, then your memories of that are, like, negative the whole time or, you know, stressful. I don't know. No, I, it, I, it, I witnessed some of that this year. Did you? Yeah, and it's, it, it's the unethical, I don't even know the word i'm looking Jackasses. for it's, yeah it's just it, it's a deer or a sheep or an elk or whatever it with us it was a deer and they were going to shoot it right out from under us they tried shooting it right out from under us and where we i was so dumbfounded my buddy and i <laughs> we couldn't believe what was happening mm. and you could see our guys on the hill and we had an 80 year old man that had the tag and we were trying to get him set up and they were going to literally shoot that buck before we could get really? they, they blew right over the top of us i mean they literally blew right over the top of us and we were like we could we were we were stunned and it's i heard of a bunch of stories this year that's been happening like that and i, just, I don't understand we're we're losing the reason why we're out there yeah it's great to shoot a big ram or, or big anything but mm -hmm. The whole reason why we're out there is to enjoy it and, and love the outdoors and and hopefully harvest a nice animal, you know, and get to eat him, you know. Yeah. You like to think that it's a minority, you know, that it's just a rare occurrence mm -hmm. to have happen like that. But, you know. You're just seeing more and more of it. Yeah, know? I think a lot of it has to do, we're, we're just seeing more and more of, of everything. And I think that just has to do with the, the ease of social media and the popularity of social media where... I mean, I think there was still a lot of big deer and big animals being killed, but now because people can actually show them off and you can mm -hmm. see it and kind of hide locations or whatever, like we're just seeing a lot more of that than we ever used to. You yeah. Know? And uh, and as a whole, I mean, most of the people you run into are great. Oh, yeah. You know, they're happy to see you get whatever you got. Or I had a buddy of mine, he killed his ram this year. He got his first desert. And uh, the other guys that were back in camp, they found out he killed a ram, and they had already they were all packed up because they had already got their ram. They unloaded everything to go ch get pictures and help really? him off the mountain with with yeah. his sheep. And he goes, "You guys don't have to." And he goes, "No, no, we want to give you a hand." And <laughs> they skinned him out life size and pulled him off the mountain. <laughs> and yeah. See, those are the guys I like. Th those are. The yeah. And I think sheep are different too. You know, the, the whole sheep hunting community, or when when you draw a sheep tag in Nevada, like so. As a resident, you've got a better chance of drawing a sheep tag in Nevada than any other state, you know. Right. And we have three species of sheep in Nevada. Mm -hmm. So there's no better place to live if you're a sheep hunter to draw those tags and be able to do it over the counter as, as cheaply as possible to kill three sheep, you know. Mm -hmm. So when somebody does draw that tag, it's like it's a big deal. Oh, yeah. It's really cool to be able to go out and do that. And a lot of the people that are killing sheep that I know are doing it. They're not doing it with guides or outfitters. Right. Not that that's there's anything wrong with that, but I think that there's a sense of pride in doing it on your own like mm -hmm. that. You know. So. Yeah. But it's just it's. I love I love going out there and just seeing what you can turn up and the stuff you see when you're out there doing it. You know. I I guess I just need more friends. You know. So <laughs> I don't know enough people that are drawing sheep tags. So. Yeah. I've, yeah. It's far and few between, unfortunately. Yeah. You know. 
But yeah, you total them up. I want how many how many sheep tags are there in Nevada total? Oh, good night. Ram, I have ram tags. I honestly, I, I don't even I'd be know. Curious. I got to look that up. I since I well, I'm now eligible to go back in the hat for this was my first year being eligible to go back into the hat for deserts. So, um, I it just I don't remember. I'd see. have to look. Yeah. I d I just put in for a couple spots. You know, they weren't the biggest rams in the area, but. I just I was wanting the tag, you know. Yeah. I want to get back on the mountain <laughs> and, and get another sheep. Yeah. So we better get off the sheep topic. That's Remy and I just did a podcast last week that that's all we talked about was just sheep and the sheep hunt that he went on and and the one that I just did. But um, so you got into go back to your story. You got into it. You were introduced to taxidermy when you were twelve. Yep. And you just kind of were enamored by it from that point on. Or? Yes, we um, everything. I couldn't I couldn't get enough stuff to I was shooting everything and stuffing it in the freezer and my mom when I was a kid you just she'd open the freezer and there'd be a dead pheasant sitting in there or a uh. duck and she'd she'd get on my case she's like we eat this stuff and you're stuffing birds in there with the feathers and everything on I'm like it's fine mom it's no big deal it's in plastic you know but oh yeah I'd I would uh get ducks whatever a deer i was always trying to scrounge up a deer for one of my family members to shoot and i didn't even the first one we did my grandpa and i we we boiled the head to where it was just nothing but bones picked all the meat out of it and we did it with fiberglass or not fiberglass but with um um plaster the, the, you did the, the head the mount oh, yeah wow. we put the head back together with plaster and sucker you couldn't hang it on the wall it was so stinking heavy <laughs> we didn't know what we were doing we were digging around i had this old book that was like from the 1940s before they made forms oh yeah forms they were still wrapping the stuff out of excelsior excelsior what's that that's uh it's the same stuff that you have like a swamp cooler it's wood shavings oh it yeah. looks like looks yeah. like straw but it's wood really yeah, they would wrap the forms out of that. They'd have a two by four frame. They would actually put the skull back in them, hmm. and they were heavy and they didn't look that good. And <laughs> yeah, can't get a lot of detail in that, huh? No. And now you know we're we have the polyurethane foam forms, and then we are also sculpture in our own. We have a few that are in the process right now, and we're almost ready to have them cast. Cool. So we have a just I sculptured up a life size desert sheep. Because there's just not that many, you know, sheep, especially, there's not a lot of forms out there. Um, Dwayne Dewey's sculpted up some really nice forms. Mm -hmm. And we use a lot of his, and then now we're going to be using some of our own. So Cool. And it's it's fun. It's a lot of fun sculpturing them because the whole skeleton, you start with the whole skeleton. Yeah. And then you build it up with oil clay so it never hardens. It's and then they cast it off of that? Yeah, we do a foam? fiberglass cast off of that huh. make a mold because i've seen you shaving you shave forms a lot do you have to alter them very much when you get them in a lot. for the 99 percent of them are altered and what's that for the size Just, of the what this they're not always anatomically accurate i mean they're close but the longer you're into it and the more that you learn you just you, you pick up stuff you know and it's just little things that you gotta you have to change if you want to make them look like they're gonna walk away right and that's one thing we pride ourselves on is getting it as as uh lifelike as possible yeah that's one thing i could compliment you on on your mounts they like they look so real it's crazy I and mean. I, I thank you for that <laughs> i mean we work we we all work my whole staff we work mm. very hard at that and uh it, it takes longer to do that versus just an assembly line we right. we're not an assembly line we we never will be i just refuse to do that and there's you know everybody's whatever you know whatever you like to do that's fine but for us that's not a direction that we want to go well i know guys i know of guys i guess i know a couple you know personally that i mean it's a six month guarantee it's mm -hmm. four to six months and we'll have your have your head for you and they do a phenomenal job you know they right. do a really good job they're mostly shoulder mounts, and so they're doing the quicker. But that's that's their model. Mm -hmm. And so they're turning them out. Their prices are, are fairly low, you know. But you can imagine, you know, I, I look at it from a business standpoint. I would much rather do what you do and focus on the bigger pieces, full body, life size, 
habitat, all that kind of thing, and have to churn out less work, but you're still you're still doing just fine with it, you know? right? Then to have the stress of saying, "Oh, I've got 300 heads to do this, you know, this winter or whatever it might be," and just cranking them out, even though you can still keep the level of the quality level high, it's it's a lot harder when you're turning out more work. But right. Plus, I think with what you do is really cool. Is a lot of guys, myself included, will bring something to you, and it's like, I don't know, man. You figure it out. You take a look at that rack or the horns or whatever else, and you decide what it, what's going to look the best. And they turn it over to you guys. Right. And how much of that? How much of that do you get to do? Like, I uh, I would say the majority of our people that come in, they just you know they might want it to be looking left or right, but mm-hmm. then they just you just make it look the best. Mm-hmm. And majority of my clients do that. It's just like. Um, that elk mountain that we did had free rain. Really? You could tell. You like, just, yep. I mean, quaking aspen trees. There's mm-hmm. just, I can't remember what a full body elk in there. Quaking aspens. There was some deer in there. Wasn't yep. there or was there not? That, that was an addition uh, that we added afterwards. Okay. We have a bunch of sheep. We got a mountain of sheep in there. The three bulls. I've got video of that. I need to try to pull that up. I'll try to include that in here. Yeah, it um, it it took it took two years, really, um, because one we didn't have the elk. Mm-hmm. He, uh, you know, you go out elk hunting, you don't expect to knock over a, a giant like he did. I mean, it so far surpassed what his expectations mm-hmm. were, and it was just an incredible year. Mm-hmm. Um, he killed two bulls, and it, they were one was four hundred and. He netted over, hair over 400, mm-hmm. and then the other one was 380. Giant. I mean, it, all in 12 days. He just, <laughs> I mean, Hunt and Fool, I think, did an article on it, and yeah. it just it was incredible. I mean, you just, sometimes you just get lucky, you know. Right, right. You need a lot of luck on your well, side. Well, yeah, when you're, when you're that successful, you can, you're, you've made a, a career out of, making your own luck you know and being successful and and that's what he obviously was able to do you know and he put himself in the position to be able to do it yep which is great um someday i'd like to be in a position and be able to do that kind of stuff but uh, it'll happen you just <laughs> yeah get the lucky and get the tag that's the thing is getting the tag it's yeah. just you get the tag and and then you have a lot of things go in your favor and i mean that bull that 400 inch plus bull that he killed Killed it on the last night. I mean, it was the sun was setting, mm. and they didn't think they were going to get get him. And he just happened to he was in thick thick timber. Mm-hmm. Bull got up, walked right towards him. He's seventy yards away, and he nailed him with a muzzle loader and knocked nice. just KO'd him right there. Hmm. So it, nice. Was that a Nevada bull? No, it was. I believe it was. Uh, it was either New Mexico or Arizona. Mm. Is yeah, where good it for was at. So, but cool. So walk me through a process when somebody brings you, like the other day that guy brought in a deer, like mm-hmm. literally the whole they pulled thing. it out of the back of the truck and dropped it right there on the mm-hmm. tarp. I'm like, man, is it, how does this work? You know, <laughs> well, I could they, never get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they, well, one, they, uh, they were, they were close enough to the road and they wanted to life size him and they're, they're not that good at life sizing them. Caping so, them out. Right. And he, they called me on. They go, we're on the mountain. We just knocked the buck over, and we we can get him to the truck. I'll just yank the guts out of him, and mm-hmm. can we bring him on in? And I'm, of course, I prefer that doing that versus having him try to skin the deer on the mountain and cutting tons of holes. And I mean, yeah. that's that's one thing in this industry is we see a lot of train wrecks. Guys, what they do in a few minutes with a knife takes us sometimes days to fix. Yeah, I think I brought you a train wreck this year. <laughs> between no. between the twenty eight nozzler and the uh the Havilon that I've used for the first time is too sharp. I brought you a train wreck. The the exit wound, that one that we'll get it fixed. But we might we might have to put that one against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> well that like that doll that's up there that had that twelve inch hole in the neck oh, yeah. that was blown you'd never know now. So he you can get away with a lot if if the material's there. Right. Um, if it's missing, then it can get ticklish. 
<laughs> yeah, you're robbing from <laughs> other things. You're you're thinking to yourself, what have I got in the shop that might work for this? Oh, I have a whole box of spare parts. Really? You just never know when you're going to need it, so they're sitting in the freezer. Do you think that's a common thing for taxidermists to do? Is it? Yeah. Yep. It's you know if if you're in it full time, yeah, you're always. If you're working on a piece and you're like, oh, this patch, this piece that we're cutting off would be a good patch mm -hmm. for something else, you know, because you're always, you're always, the the bullets, you know, especially like antelope and sheep, they're thin skinned and man, sometimes the holes you get blown in them, the yeah. exit wounds. And then it just seems lately since they've changed, you know, the bullets, mm -hmm. you know, they've gone to the ballistic tips and stuff like that. The exit wounds just seem to oh, be devastating. Oh, it's horrible. Well, I think it's because you can use a lighter round mm -hmm. and still have the same devastation, you know, like mm -hmm. a 6.5 or a 26 nozzler or some of those. They, they hit plenty hard for a smaller round and they're not kicking like a mule, you know, mm -hmm. like a 300 ultra mag or something. Right. But I know I experienced that with the, I'm shooting a 28 nozzler for the last couple of years and it, it, it doesn't hit me super hard, but man, it hits the animals hard. You know, it's crazy. Well, it, I just I shoot a 300 Winchester. Yeah. And but m the bullets I've been using, they, you know, they they hang together really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't had that, hadn't had too much, um, pro too many problems with the uh, exit wound. <laughs> um, <laughs> Why is that? I, uh, you know, I don't know. I mm -hmm. don't know. I have no idea, but I've been very lucky. I like the, the last one I shot an odd ad mm -hmm. out of Texas and uh, he was about a hundred yards away and I shot him right through the front shoulders, little hole in and about a quarter size hole out the other side. And yeah. he did go a ways. I was su surprised to Those see how things far are tough. Oh, he went, he jumped probably 25 yards straight in the air. Yeah, I don't doubt it. Straight up. I don't doubt that one bit. There. And he was double lunged. I mm -hmm. shot about, I was probably two, three inches over the top of the heart and blew both lungs out of him. And he still went 100 yards. And I mean, just, he wasn't even bleeding. All mm -hmm. the blood was inside of him. That's been one of my favorite hunts to date is that odd ad hunt, you know, in, in Texas. And I've talked about it before, but like it was a, it was a deal where called some, because Texas, it's all private land mm -hmm. and you have to go through a, a guide or an outfitter or a landowner or whatever else i called this guy that did he did um odd ad hunts but he also offered some do-it-yourself hunts mm -hmm. so i called him and he says well we've kind of got everything all booked but i got this property that we've had hunters down there nobody there's been very little success or whatever you're welcome to go down there we don't know if, if the sheep are hanging out there in april but you can go try it so my brother and I went down there in April, and the sheep weren't hanging out there. You know, we I think we both killed. He killed a couple of ewes, and I killed a ewe. We didn't see any rams in that area. Well, then he invited me to come back. He's like, well, why don't you come back before the hunts start out next year in November, or the same year in November. Why don't you come out then? They should be rutting. We, we don't usually hunt that time because we focus on our deer hunts, but you can come out to that same area, same property, see if you can find a ram. And that's when I found that ram. So it was like it was super hard hunting, even though when you when you hear Texas, mm -hmm. Audad, your typical hunt is not a not a hard hunt. Like right. I might go back in February with my buddy Riley Warwood, and he's saying I'll guarantee you'll see two hundred sheep. You know, yeah. and I'm like, man, if I saw six sheep the last time I was down there, in addition to the one I killed, like that that would be amazing to just go and see those animals. But they're just it's just a cool animal. You know, and it's it's a sheep species, and those horns are still awesome. Oh, they're awesome. You know? I love them. I, I want to go get another one. I yeah. I know I'm not going to have a full mountain of doll sheep or right. or stones or whatever, so um, I would love to do a nice showpiece with a bunch of rams, and I'm I'm good with collecting a few odd ads yeah. and doing that, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, it's not a bighorn sheep per se, but it's – it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, you're, you're hunting them in the same type of country. They're still, they're wild friggin' animals, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean. I call it a poor man's desert it, sheep hunt. It is. Because <laughs> they're just like hunting desert sheep. It is. There's more of them probably. Right. Oh, yeah, sheep. a lot more of them. And there are hunts where you can go on where you can basically pick your ram. I mean, you can just be like, ah, oh, there's a dozen rams there. Let me just. Like, there's hunts. I, most of the hunts that I've seen on TV, when I went and did mine, I watched a bunch of hunts on YouTube or whatever else. And that's what I saw. And that's so that's what I was kind of expecting.
mm-hmm. and man, my eyes were open in this area. So yep. the area I hunted, the same thing. I had to actually go back. Yeah. I didn't get a ram on the first. I saw one ram, the first trip, and it was well. One there was low density of sheep in there, mm-hmm. and then um, it was so heavily timbered. Mm-hmm. It was like going to Ely and hunting really? in those flats with all the junipers. Yeah, and the the guy told me he goes. It was a do-it-yourselfer. I mean, they did your food and everything, but you didn't have a guide with you. Yeah, you see, I'm sleeping in the back of my truck, yeah. cooking my own food, you know, sleeping with my sidearm next to me because <laughs> I'm right on the border. Oh, like, fun. It was, it was, yeah, it was. It was Western. <laughs> it was very Western, yeah. No, with with ours, it was, it was, uh, um, you know, there was plenty of other animals on the place, but mm. um, the odd edge were just, there was a low number of them, and then to you can't glass you're just yeah. still hunting because it's thick and after being there and seeing them like i under i get it you know you're you're not gonna go spot and stalk something because you never get to him it's just so thick and noisy and but it was still fun it was a blast and we wound up getting a ram eventually but well that's why i was talking to riley and he's like yeah i just went down and shot one with shot it with my bow i'm like you shot you shot an odd ad sheep with your bow i'm like that's impossible you know, because that from my experience of hunting the sheep, I'm like, that's friggin' impossible. You're amazing. Mm-hmm. He's like, no, 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 you don't get it. There's this is not a high fence. This is a cattle operation or whatever. Uh, his 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 place that he has. I mean, it's special because it has some Indian artifacts and different things. So there's areas you can't go. So it's kind of a protected spot. But he's like, there are sheep everywhere. You know, if you want to try to kill one with your bow. This is probably one of the best places to try it. You yeah. know, so. I want to go hunt a place like that. I want to go and see. Come with me in February, first week of February. I might go. I'm, I'm like eighty percent that I'm going to go down. Well, we're going to have, <laughs> we're going to have to, we'll have to talk. talk. Yeah, that right? sounds like a plan because <laughs> I haven't done anything this year other than being yeah. the grunt. I've been the grunt a lot this year, but yeah, you know, not not drawn anything. I was really bummed. I thought for sure I'd had a, a tag this year, but yeah. So do you do, do you do the grunt work here in the tax derby shop? Yep, you're the grunt. Well, sometimes. Sabrina, is he the grunt? Yeah, I've been the grunt a lot. I've been working, well, I was 13, four, no, 13 days straight. Yeah. But it, what happened is, unfortunately, one side of my staff, they wound up all getting the flu, and I didn't want the flu. Right. And it was the pukey flu, so I'm like, I already had that. I don't, I don't want it again, so you stay home. And then it was just me. So, <laughs> yeah, it is, it's all, you do what you got to do, you know, sometimes it's just yourself and I don't mind them. It, honestly, it, um, sometimes it's during hunting season, you know, we, like the other night we, uh, it was a late night the guy killed his ram. It was his first sheep and we were here until I bet you 11 o'clock at night, but we were just, I was skinning his sheep life size. And he's amped because he's got his ram and everything. And my wife was here and everybody was here. It was kind of like, yeah, I was working. But still, it was just the excitement of a new hunter sheep hunting. I mean, he's he's hunted a lot. But, I mean, for sheep, he's he was green. So it was his first ram and just the excitement. And I love seeing that with clients, is, you know, or with friends that have never hunted. You know, you see that excitement on them and it just it's catchy and i i love it i just i get fired up you know yeah. and, and we just had a ball and i i could have stayed here all night long you right. know after you get home you're like amped you know and yeah. so it just i think that's probably the part of the job that isn't the job right you know it's there's definitely times it's a job you know it's like uh you know if you ever have a, like a disgruntled cu- customer i hate having to I hate that. You don't ever have those. Oh, occasionally we do, unfortunately. But <clears throat> you know, you're in the service industry. You're going to have one or two. Yep. Yep. And I'm the kind of person that I, I lay literally lay will lay awake. Yeah, you don't handle stress very well, do you? No. <laughs> no, I don't. Not anymore. I used to be able to handle it, but not not anymore. Mm. But um, but you know, we work around it. Right. Right. It's all it's all good. You just uh, but I seriously. I, I work very hard at keeping our clients happy. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about this. Is this I think will be will be good information um, when somebody is in Alaska or remote or whatever. 
they get something down back in the back country. What's the process? What should they do first? What shouldn't they do? Like, what would you recommend time frame wise? You know, say I'm, so I'm in the back country of, of Alaska, and I knock down, I don't know, moose, black-tailed deer, moose, whatever it is. Well, first off, what I would recommend to anybody is if, you know, one, you have to book those hunts out. You know, so you've got a, at least a year to right. prepare for it. Um, I would recommend going to a, whoever your taxonomist is, whatever, and learning how to um, face cape and field care um that's the biggest thing with um that we see in the industry is uh even with outfitters so what's a face cape let's explain to somebody that doesn't face know what's a face cape that's peeling the uh, hide off of the face mm -hmm. and you know you don't have to do a clean job and when i say clean job like when i skin one you don't have to flesh it it's it's just blue skin only parts that have a little bit of meats around the nose and around the eyes and then you go in and you take care of that i don't expect a client to do that that you need to skin a lot to get that good but just being able to get that hide off and then uh learning how to turn ears if if you know if you're in alaska and stuff like that a lot of, like with an outfitter a lot of the guys will they'll either come in pick up the the skin and horns no. And fly it out to attack. No, I'm him. I'm talking about the guy that's the do-it-yourself guy. Okay, you know the one that's <clears throat> it's all on him. Like okay. it's his responsibility. Like your moose when you right. went on that moose yep. hunt. Um, that you you need to get in with a guy and brush up on how to to do field care on on a cape. And you can um, we offer we do it all the time with clients that are going to go do that. Show them how to face cape one. And then turn in ears and stuff like that. Um, a moose is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you can stick your entire fist down one one nostril. So, um, you know, so there's there's a lot of work involved. But yeah, that was where I would be starting is brush up on how to do field care, and then um, you know that that's the biggest biggest thing. And flesh it as much as you can yep, while it's up there. It. Yep, you have to. You have to. <coughs> Get them fleshed. You can't. You can salt over a little bit of meat, but I mean, not much. Um, no, I think on that moose, I spent a half a day mm -hmm. just fleshing it as much as possible. Yeah, moving around it. But yeah. I didn't turn the ears. I just took as much of the cartilage out as I could. But I didn't go all the way in and right. turn the whole ear. And if you're gonna be there a long time, it's something you have to do because mm -hmm. they just. Unless you're real cold temperatures, mm -hmm. if you have if you have access to um, like a walk-in freezer, now you don't have that in Alaska, of course. But um, the uh, you know the weather conditions have a huge, or it does have a huge effect on how long you can keep a, a animal out there. If it's cold, then you're fine. You mm -hmm. you can you can just skin them and don't even worry about it. If it's getting into the sure. 30s at night and um, but if it's warm, like antelope, antelope, that's the number one animal that comes in spoiled. You can lose one in less than 24 hours. Really? Yeah. And you have to get that neck meat out. Like, um, say you're scared to do a face, you know, face cape it. Antelope are hard because the hair comes out right. so easy. Loosely fitted. Yeah. It's one of their, their defenses, you know, if animal, they're long haired. Mm -hmm. yeah, if a coyote or whatever grabs them and doesn't get a good hold on them. All they get is a mouth of hair, and um, the antelope takes off running. So <laughs> right, right. <laughs> coyote gets hair. But, um, no, it's, it's very important to, if you're not going to face cape them, at least get the neck out of them. And what you do is you basically you start at the base of the head. You can if, When you have an animal laying there, you can feel on the back of their head, and you can feel that little knob. Mm -hmm. And that's where you just stick it in, stick the knife right in there. And then you can get your knife up underneath the skin and then just run it right on down the back. Mm -hmm. And you can run it all the way to their tail. That's what I usually do is go yes. all the way to the butt. That's how I do it. Um, best thing, too, is when you have the animal f um, down, first thing you do is you do all your cuts. Mm -hmm. And that way the, the hide's tight on the animal. And then once you get your cuts, then you can go ahead and start skinning. 
and that's what I recommend to all all my guys that are doing that. Yeah, that's what I do. I did a video on that on one of my I think it was the elk that I showed all of the initial cuts first, mm-hmm. and then and then just basically start skinning it from there, and then take the meat off after that. Right. Hmm. And if you have the time, you know, uh, while you're caping it, you know, take your time because the cleaner you do it. Well, let's work on the other end. Now, for someone that's just skinning one in the field, I don't even, I wouldn't worry about it. Me, I'll leave the membrane um, it's, or the flank. You know, that f- it's really, really thin, thin meat, and then it's a right. pain in the butt to try to keep it off the skin and leave mm-hmm. it on the animal. But um, when I'm doing that, I, if you can get it started, and then you can punch it right out, and, you know, especially if they're, little warm mm-hmm. you know they they'll punch it's a lot out. easier when oh warm. so much easier yeah. um now like muskox you're skinning every square inch of him you're not going to punch that sucker yeah. out yeah. um <laughs> <I've> <laughs> or when you're coming back to him the next day or whatever it's it's hard to, right yeah yeah and the other um you know the other thing too is a lot of guys will uh, gut them and sometimes leave them overnight and we've done it I mean, everybody's done it you mm-hmm. Um, but man, I generally try to get them skinned just for, it holds that heat, like on an elk and stuff like that. It, you just, it is, it it cooks them. I've seen guys lose elk and overnight. Yeah. If it's early season, I will always, I'll always take the hide off and take the, take it off the least, at least quarter it. You know, I might not go ahead and and take the bone out and everything until the following day, but it's all circumstantial. But if it's not, if it's cold out, I mean, I've. I've been where just a few years ago I killed an elk way back in, and I was out of food and just I just didn't want to be there. So I gutted him, cleaned him out, went home thinking that I could come back with my buddies. Well, they couldn't come back, so I go back in and do it on my own. But like it's sometimes it's okay to leave it like that, but you got to understand and know the temperatures. And mm-hmm. what would you say is kind of a good temperature range that a person could leave leave one overnight? I'd say for me to feel comfortable, I would want it you know close to you know dropping down into the th- high 30s would mm. be my yeah my guess you know? i always I always say you know 40 mid 40s or less is is okay anything above that the hide's coming off you mm-hmm. know yeah you know, you know i haven't had that many early season tags mm. my, now my elk hunt was an early hunt and there we it was you wouldn't have been able to leave him you'd have had him f- cooked by the mm. next morning but we had a, i had a rifle early rifle hunt and for rut and it, it, it was so warm at night, and during the day it was approaching 80 degrees. Oh, and you It's know hard to find a cool spot in the desert, too. Oh, exactly. And then we wound up, we skinned the whole entire thing, opened him up, quarter, took the quarters off, hung them all in the trees, mm-hmm. took everything we could that night, and then we were back in there the, first, the, the very next morning. And I was still worried that we might lose something. Yeah, I think... I don't worry about it as much because I've had I've a lot of my experience is in the early season and is in here in Nevada where where it's warmer. Like I've just learned that if you can get it in the shade, out of the direct sunlight, you can get the skin off of it, get the bone out of it, and get a little bit of a breeze on it. Like even even on a eighty degree weather day, if you've got it in a good spot, like you can reach up and touch it and it's cool. Right. You know, if if you can if you can do that. Of course, you can't do that for very long, Mm-mm. but a day. A day or an overnight is not a problem at all to get that that meat back. Right. Um, I think where most of the, the troubles and where I worry about it is on the pack out. So right. once it's all in the bag and on top of each other, if it's not cooled down to begin with, like you're holding all that heat in there. And so that's when I really worry about getting it out. And as soon as I get it to the truck or down to a staging point, I'll get it hung out and mm-hmm. where it can get that air and, and cool down again. Right. But yeah. Well, yeah. Air, you get that glaze on them and which they... You know, you start skinning them. I've even, you know, you'll start having them glaze up just just yep. as you're you're skinning away. You know, yeah. and you don't even have the hide off of them, and they're already, yeah. you know, glazing. So, um, salting. So get the hide off. What if they? Okay, the best thing to do, you know, is you. I always tell guys take care of your hide like you do your meat. And I would have. I always tell my guys take a special uh, separate cooler. And it's okay if you get the hide wet. It's not going to, for the time that it's wet, it's not going to spoil on you. I just say 
bring a whole extra cooler, bring ice. You can take your, even if you can't face cape it, just take and put that head in there and pile the ice on it. Mm -hmm. And you're good to go. And it'll stay for days. As long as you've got ice, right? Yeah. I mean, because you're, if your meat's not spoiling, your hide's not spoiling. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tell everybody. And that's with, well, with when I go out, I mean, I just face cape it. Turn yeah, your ears, yeah. lips, and everything. Salt it, roll it up, and I you, you See, don't have to worry about it. And if you know if you, if you know enough ahead of time, you can plan for that on your hunt. Like mm-hmm. you can recognize most of my hunts that I go on, I know that I'm within a day's drive of you, mm-hmm. and so I'll just make sure and care for it, just like I do my meat. It goes in a game bag, and then it goes into a a plastic garbage bag, and then sometimes another plastic garbage bag, and then it goes in the cooler. So mm-hmm. where and I don't like to put water on it. I don't like I don't even put water on my meat. No. So I try to use. Um, you know, I'm using milk jugs, frozen milk jugs for my ice just to keep keep all the water off of it that I can. And then I just bring it in and drop it off to you, and you flush it, turn the ears or whatever whatever you need to do. But I like the process of face caping them, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I just, to me, it's just all part of it. Um, right. And I enjoy that, mm-hmm. that part of it. So It's, it's a lot of fun. I, 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 I look forward to it. By when, when hunting season rolls around, I always loved the, when the first antelope rolls in because that's yeah. the first thing that comes in. That is either antelope or archery muley. Right. And it's, it's relaxing to me, you know. <laughs> You're so, ready. Yeah. So should a person even worry about salting something? You know, I would say no. I because would. once it's salted, it's... It makes it tough. You've, if you gotta, you've taken it to another step. Mm-hmm. And you can't... It's hard to go back and reverse that step, right? Right. And if you salt over the top of meat what happens it draws all that moisture out of the meat and then you got a scab it never touched it didn't penetrate the skin itself so you basically have a scab and then you it turns it into jerky and it just it's it makes it rough um sometimes you you have to rehydrate them you know to get them or that you can get them cleaned up the uh the best thing is, like I said, just rolling them up and putting them in on ice. And, I mean, if you're proficient and you can turn the ears, turn the, um, you know, pull all the meat off of them, mm-hmm. of course, you know, that's the best. But most people don't. I mean, it's not yeah, what they it's do. Not, yeah. you know, it's not their profession, you know. So I, the best thing is just having them and putting them on ice. And How long, because I've heard different things, how long will a cape last? Like, like say how I do them when I clean them up, flush them, and everything else, roll them in a couple of bags, drop it in the freezer. How long is that going to survive in a freezer for someone? If you have it wrapped up really, really well, it could last. I've had animals in the freezer for 10 years. Really? And no no guff, man. It, mm. it, 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 they're fine, You but you have to have them wrapped really, really well. Right. And so the way I was taught, and I don't it, – it was before you, but skin on skin. Mm-hmm. Lips and ears, head and ears. First, roll towards yep. the feet, and I even I even double roll the the ends in, mm-hmm. so that there's no ends that are exposed. So it's just a fold, just like this here. You you just have a fold that's exposed. Double bag it, put it in the freezer, and then I think I have a cape in there now, still actually, okay. a javelina or something. Okay, that's in there. But um, I was curious of how long. So now let's say once it's once it's at this point. Like you have some on the shelf behind you. You might not be able to see it from there. Once it's been salted and dried, are those hides there? Have they already been to the tanner? Oh, no. No, those are so all those the are just skins. salted and dried sitting those, there on the shelf. Yeah, those are the skins that have come in this season. And we will be sending them out right after the f- first of the year. We Generally, we won't send anything out during the holidays right. just for the chance of law. Lo- you know, we don't want to yeah. lose somebody's skin. Mm-hmm. So we... We generally we won't send anything out until right after the first of the year. Then we'll send all the skins off to be, be tanned. And so what you'll do is client brings in, in a skin. You flush it, turn it, trim it, get it all prepped, ready to go. Then you salt it, mm-hmm. dry it, fold it up. Tag it. Tag it. Get as many as you need to to make it worth shipping to the tannery, and then you put them in the crate and ship them to the tannery. Yep. When they come back, are they, they're dry. They're dry tan, yes. Do they look much different than that? Yeah, they, they, yeah, a lot different. They're <laughs> actually, they just look like a leather jacket, but mm. with the hair on it, and it smells just like a leather shop. Yeah, it's. 
I love it when the, all the skins come rolling back in. It it does. It just smells like you walked into a yeah. place where you're buying a leather jacket or something, you know. Well, and Sabrina was here with a Dal sheep, um, trimming it. Mm-hmm. It was so it had come back from the the tannery. Right. She was trimming trimming and thinning some of the facial features, the ears, yep. and different cartilage and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Pulling the cartilage out. She's currently she's working on the lips and the nose. Um, we call it pairing it. You know. Mm-hmm. But you're basically, yeah, so all you're doing is thinning, thinning everything and getting it ready for, for mounting. And then fixing the holes. That ram, unfortunately, took a really bad tumble. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, it's going to have a lot of work before we're <laughs> able to mount it. <laughs> yeah. I hate it when they roll down the hill. Well, I was shocked to see this dowel that you have here, you know, with that hole in the neck was, golly, it's it huge. was that big. Huge. And uh, just the patch that you'd sewed in. I mean, it looks just like you would go to a sewing shop and sh- sew the patch in there. Mm-hmm. And when you look at it, you can't even tell. Yeah, it it, it hid really, really well. I was yeah. nervous that we might not be able to get it, but because it was, well, that's that's like the worst blowout that I've ever seen on yeah. a on a sheep next yeah. to yours. You're you on the 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 oh, rope. That, that, <laughs> that hey, exit wound's sh- bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was ugly. So um, the one next to it. Yes. The, I saw something on Instagram on the horn. You had a Dremel out. What were you doing? I was taking so uh, the guy. He uh, hit it in the back of the horn, and that that's the exit wound <laughs> where it come out the front. Yeah. Blew all the horn. It, what happened? It was. He's it, lucky it didn't come off. Oh yeah, he's really lucky he didn't blow it completely off. But it just, it looked like a compound fracture. Mm-hmm. Just it is ex- look, yeah, it just Real exploded. Splintered it and splintered out. So we're gonna we cut all the splinters away, and then we're gonna piece it back in there, and then we're gonna take an epoxy and fill in the cracks. You won't even know. So you're when, rebuilding that. Yeah, we'll re- rebuild rebuild it. Interesting. And Pe- do people? prefer to do that a lot or do they just figure eh, that's just the way it is it's most of the people prefer them fixed fixed really mm-hmm. yeah it, um the uh i've had one i had one guy he 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 put a hole through an elk horn and i put it on instagram not even thinking i just like i was like pretty cool i just videoed with my phone and you could look through the hole and you could see the tip of the horn where it blew the oh, yeah, tip cool. of the horn off I I wound up getting like, oh shoot, I forget. It was like th- almost forty thousand likes, uh-huh. just on that. I'm like, yeah. What, what are people thinking? <laughs> I'm like, just a bullet hole, but people loved it. And so I, I think um, I don't think there's a lot of taxidermists really showing the process or showing stages of the process. No, like you're not giving away any trade secrets by any means, mm-hmm. but you're. That's the thing that I really like about what you're doing. You're showing different elements to the process Mm -hmm. um which is really cool i don't know if really anybody else is doing that yeah go ahead sorry i was just gonna say there's a lot of really really good taxidermists that i follow on instagram just because i like i like that imagery and i Mm -hmm. like to see you know all this stuff but none of them are doing that right no and i don't i don't know why if they just don't want to take the time or what but you know that's one thing in this industry people don't understand what goes in to what we do it's you know People just don't know. Yeah. Um, I still have people asking me, do you put the real eyes in them? Yeah, really? I'm like, mm, Yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Are the bones still under there? Yeah, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, yeah, that, you know, that, that show that uh, yeah. mounted in Alaska or whatever it was. Oh, I, I vaguely remember that. Was that Alaska or was that Pennsylvania? No, it was Alaska. Oh, okay. Um, uh, Knights, taxidermy or whatever. Love the show because they showed, you know, what yeah. went into it. And I, I was surprised that they didn't keep it going. I don't know if they just didn't get enough following. A lot of that has to do with just masses of interest. You mm-hmm. know, they probably had a lot of interest by people like yourselves and those in the outdoor community. But mm-hmm. we're small. Yeah. We're a tiny number compared to, I mean, look at look at mainstream television today. It's like it has nothing to do with our types of lifestyle. Really. Right. Even the shows that they have, you know, the Alaskan shows and that, there's so much um fakery i guess mm-hmm. there's there's other terms for it but right there's a lot of stuff that's not how it really is right you know, so yeah it, 
Yeah, but yeah, we the the response we're getting on Instagram, it, it's crazy. Um, you know, you and it's all. I can post a picture of a finished deer or a sheep or whatever, and you'll get 500 if you're lucky mm -hmm. likes. And you you post a video of me like for say soaking a skin, mm -hmm. it blows up. That one blew up. Yeah, the the sheep. Yeah, I'm like, okay. Well, then you know the light bulb kind of went off. I'm like, ah, people want to see how this is going together. Yeah. You know, they don't they like the finished product, but seeing seeing a skinning or seeing us you know trimming up the the sheep horn yeah. you know stuff like that the people they're intrigued by it well so. that's the way i see it is is um i'm glad you do it because to me it's like it's good entertainment it's mm -hmm. it's good information it's good content and i don't ever see you asking for anything in return or promoting yourself saying you know hey come come bring your animal to us it's like no you're just providing a service to somebody that's interested in taxidermy work and uh it's awesome i like yeah. it i think that's why you get a lot of really really good response off of it yeah. um yeah i i love doing it i mean i i want people to know what we what goes into what we do i think if you show people what actually goes on in there that then they have a better understanding of what you're doing you're not just taking a a, a hide and throwing it on a form it's not not it's, the case it's art <laughs> it exactly really it is an art it is yeah. an art form like you have all phases of it you have sculpturing sculpturing you have sewing and you have all phases of it in there and um and it just depends on how far you want to take it yeah. i mean you go to the like you competed at the world level which i've done once i'd love to do it more um but the the sad fact is that they're always on the they're either in the midwest or the east coast yeah. and it's expensive to ship an animal plus you're losing a week and you know eventually i'd like to get back into that but yeah you meet you you're you're with the best in the world and the work that goes in there it's unbelievable yeah. love it you some of your work has been recognized hasn't it mm -hmm. like i don't know if it was contests or competitions or yeah. just mbu or whatever it is yeah we've we've well they have a the mbu show dinner they have a a people's choice mm -hmm. you know um we won that uh we won that one year we had did a, a bunch of sheep we had th three sheep together and they picked our ram and then you know um that that was one then um when i first started they used to have a competition also in Fallon and won that a couple times. And then I competed at the world level. Um, it was in 07 mm -hmm. and it was the first time I ever competed at that level. And I kind of wanted, everybody says, you know, you're good. You're really good. You're really good. You know? <laughs> yeah, and I'm yeah. like, well, I know. Okay. But you know, it's, I want to hear that from my peers. You know, right. there's people that I really respect in the industry. So, you know, I just wanted to see where you stacked up with the rest. Yeah. And I entered, it was in the professional division to get my feet wet because I was not going to go into the masters. I mean, those guys that are in the masters have been doing it. and They, they know the politics behind it. They know. Yeah, they know what the judges what like for. and everything. So I just went in and entered the professional level, and I took a high second. I missed first place by just. High second, what's that, like a B plus? Yep. <laughs> yep. It was, uh, I wound up getting like a 90 or an 86 or 87 on it. I have to look on my ribbon. Mm -hmm. But 90 is first place. Um, there was only one first place given in our division. And um, so I walked away very, very happy. Um, it, ex I exceeded my expectations being my first time. Mm -hmm. Met with some of the best in the industry, and they couldn't even believe that I had never competed. The guy, when he was looking at my deer, and he is probably the best deer taxidermist in the industry for whitetail. I have never seen him mount a muley, but um, the work that guy hmm. is doing, and he's older. I mean, he was at that time, he was, I think he was pushing 70. At that time. Yeah, wow. so I don't even know if he, I don't, I've never seen anything yeah. where he had passed away yet, but, um, but anyway, 
he loved it. He was he goes, "Do you mind if I go over your mount?" And I'm like, "Not at all. I'm I'm all ears. I'm here yeah. to learn, you know." Yeah. So um he loved it. He just and it, you know, he's talking to me and I asked or he asked me he goes, "You know, how long have you been competing?" And I'm like, "I never have." And he just looked at me like, "Really?" He wanted me to come back and work with him. Hmm. Unfortunately, he was again on the east coast and i'm like well i gotta make a living yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um it was a great experience loved it and i just i'll get back doing it does it do you see like what's the what's the point of it or what's the value of it do you gain clients from it no potential you know, clients? it's it's purely it's purely for me it's mm -hmm. one you get to uh meet the other other guys or women and now women women in the industry are growing mm -hmm. uh, it's you know, you're getting a lot more women involved. Um, but you just get to meet uh, other people that are wanting to learn and just as hungry and they're better than you or some of them aren't quite as good as you, but you're all, there's, it's just exchanging information. Um, and it gives you a lot of uh, motivation mm -hmm. just to do better. And, you know, you know self-satisfaction. It's like, okay, you know, I, I can... I can hang with them, you know, yeah. you know, and um, that's for me, it's I want to meet the people and 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 just better myself, you know, yeah, you cool. got guys that are willing to share. It's not this big secret, you know, I can't tell you or I'm going to have to kill you kind of a thing. You know, they're willing to help. Yeah. Do you have any trade secrets that you'd kill somebody for? I got a few. <laughs> uh, we got a few secrets that people are just dying to know how we do it and i'm like oh you i'm sorry <laughs> yeah. you, you come in i might but just to throw it out there on instagram no we won't share yeah, that yeah. part that's what gives us a little bit of the edge yeah. on some of our stuff yeah but you know you just everybody's got a little something they don't share I everything agree. you know <laughs> i'm the same exact way i get so many requests to sh what's your camera equipment you know or how do you how do you do this or that and i'm like yeah just not not quite ready to share that yet for one i think people will be disappointed and for two those are my kind of my trade secrets you know mm -hmm. doing what i do how much how much of what you see on instagram or youtube or whatever whatever else is solo hunter style stuff now you know self-filmed self mm -hmm. now because of technology but i was doing this before even smartphones were around you know and now everybody's kind of has that same look and appeal to it and i find myself as a progressivist in in content creation looking at it of well what's what's my next phase you know what's my next step to separate myself from everyone else because that was kind of my thing that was my in to be different than anyone else you know so i imagine it's the same in, in a lot of trades it's what can we do differently like you with your sceneries you know and just the entire element that goes into a mount rather than just a, a head on the wall right well and then that's the other thing too is like with the life size and doing the habitat we'll have more time in the habitat than we do actually putting the animal together hmm. uh, it it can get extensive uh we actually we had a piece i would have liked to competed with it. it it was at the m or not the mbu no it was at the mbu show i didn't compete with it but it was it was in there for people to see and then i had it at the sheep show mm -hmm. and we had a full month just in the habitat you're kidding hmm. no it was the the lichen is what really took an unbelievable amount of time because anybody that's been up north lichen i mean the lichen's so thick in those rocks that you, sometimes you can't even see the rock because mm -hmm. it's just solid lichen and then the people go well the rock's black and i'm like yes it's black but it's not really black you're it's looking not really at a rock yes as you're looking at the lichen you're not looking at the rock if you peel that lichen away you'll see that the rock is a different color but so how did you recreate the lichen that's the, that's one the, of the secret. secrets oh, i yeah. cannot talk about <laughs> but um a few of my friends i've told them how but yeah, uh, yeah. it uh it's very involved i mean there's is several you, processes that you grow your own mold on it or your own moss on it exactly so, <laughs> you know it's all done by hand yeah. everything is oh, all wow. that stuff is by hand and it's hand painted mm -hmm. um hmm. but uh you know 
I will say we do a, a lot of our paints is uh, we use a lot of different types of paints. Sure. Uh, oils. Oh. There's a great one. Yeah. Oil paints are. Do awesome. you do? Um, is it airbrushing or is it hand on, hand painted? On the uh, rocks, it's all hand. It's all hand painted. And uh, we well, we use squirt bottles mm -hmm. with uh, acrylic paints mm -hmm. and or house paints, you know, uh, latex and all that. But uh, that's for your base colors. But mm -hmm. for all the fine detailed. It, that's all done by hand yeah. huh and yeah. it you can just spend hours like you start getting into water scenes and stuff like that it's it's just crazy how many hours you can put into it yeah. so you'll do everything you've done some fish i noticed last spring you were doing a lot of fish yep we we do everything we do birds we don't we haven't posted many pictures of <laughs> birds just the when the economy tanked birds aren't cool well they're kind of cool they're not as cool as antlers and horns. Right. But for a waterfowler, fowler, I'm right. an avid waterfowler. I mean, you wouldn't know it now but because the bird hunting has been so lousy. But uh, I just eat, sleep, and drink duck hunting really? and goose hunting. But uh, we the reason why we haven't posted many pictures of birds is uh, when the economy tanked, we the bird work went away. Hmm. Just flat went away. I mean, I, I know there's guys here locally that are doing birds and um, – but, yeah, it just kind of, it never came back for us. I mean, ours went into the life-size stuff and everything, but um, I love birds. But you're seeing them kind of trickle back in a little bit. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it just, I don't know. I don't know if people just don't want to spend the money on them or. It's hard to say. I can see birds being <clears throat> a really cool complement to the to the habitat. They're the you most know. difficult thing to do. Bird mm. Birds are the hardest out of all the animals. Birds are the toughest. Mm. Because you have to skin those little buggers, you have to defat them, and I have a machine back there. And we, my grandfather built the machine for me, and really? we call him Jaws. <laughs> and I've trained a lot of people over the years, and I go, if you can get past the defatting process, you're good. But I go, you got to get past Jaws first. <laughs> and when I was a kid, how I learned how to defat, I'd thin paper. I'd sit there and thin paper without knocking a hole in it, and that gave you the light. Uh, it, it, you, you have to have that light touch. Yeah. And once you got that light touch, then you can buzz a bird real quick. I mean, guys nowadays they have those, they have those special bird buzzers and all that that you can defat a bird fast. And they're, mm -hmm. they're, I mean, it's not easy, but it's a lot easier than Jaws than back Jaws. there. Jaws don't forgive. He'll he'll eat it up fast. So. Jaws is a belt sander. <laughs> In case you didn't know, it's a belt sander. <laughs> But it's sentimental. That's why I have never replaced him. It just, my grandpa built it. And hmm. so. Did your grandfather, did he do taxidermy also? No. Or it was just kind of a hobby for him as you were interested in it, picking it up? Yep. He just kind of was over my shoulder and would dink around with it and hmm. with me. And he, uh, well, he was a huge part of it, him and, him and grandma. My mom and dad were too, but mom and dad were working you know your so. mom's a big part of it now yes she's our secretary now and it's been a heaven housekeeper I've, every time i'm in here she's got a mop cleaning oh, yeah. up something she's always mopping stuff up and she's like you're making my floor bloody and i'm like well it's the season mom i'm sorry <laughs> you're <laughs> but, making my blood clean you're, <laughs> you're cleaning my but no she's been great <clears throat> having her here and she's she runs the office and then she of course cleans and now she's even uh doing repair work for oh. us so cool. she She's done sewing all her life, so mm -hmm. she goes, well, like, how hard can it really be? She goes, it's no different than putting a dress together. It just has hair. Yeah. I'm like, well, we'll give you a go, and she's doing great. She loves it. So. Yeah, yeah it's a family thing. I can You can hear the coos of the baby in there, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And yep. then, uh, Grandma's in here occasionally. and. Yep. Yeah. I say occasionally. I see her in here more than I see you in here. That's because I've been busy running around. Yeah. I got to pick stuff up and <laughs> I've deliver stuff, delivering things, picking animals up. And it's been a, it's been a great year. Okay. I mean, it's, this year has been the best year since, since the uh, economy tanked. I mean, it yeah. is, well, actually in our history of sure. since we've started, we started in 95. Mm. Officially started. Officially started in 95. I worked with, uh, or with Some all of them. them. Yeah. I worked with a lot of the great guys that, that are here locally mm -hmm. and then uh even went to utah 
worked with a guy in Utah mm-hmm. for a while, and uh, that was a great experience. And then just kind of made my rounds and put in my hard knocks, and yeah, you never stop learning. You're always learning. Yeah. You know. Well, and you've done you've done work for a lot of a lot of people. You know, mm-hmm. when I I think I've got some video or some pictures of it. You had a Colombian whitetail. It's Shockey's Jim, Jim Shockey's, Shockey's yeah. Colombian whitetail. And that was a world record, or what was the At deal the with time that time? It was yes was it? for a muzzleloader mm-hmm. for muzzleloader. So you've done some work for Jim Shockey. You've mm-hmm. done some work for Tim Burnett. I mean, mm-hmm. you've you've had some big wigs. I'm man. a big boy now. I'm becoming <laughs> a diva, man. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till this podcast hits. You'll think diva. Uh, yeah. Well, no, I just get staff in here. I, I just do what I want to do and let yeah. them do the other right? stuff. Yeah. Just no, kidding there. <laughs> you can tell that you enjoy what you do. Like when, when you're on, you're on. Like you can tell that you eat it up. Um, you do a great job with it and everything. So well, I truly, I truly love it. I've, you know, even as a kid, uh, always loved the, I, I just, from when I could barely walk, the outdoors is just is part of me. It's where I'm at home, mm-hmm. and you know, hunting with my grandpa and my dad, I just you know, just truly loved it. And I I'd, I'd do anything. I you know, I'd sleep at night. You know, when you're getting ready to go, and I mean, I'll even get that way when I'm when I'm getting ready to do a cool piece. You know, I can't sleep. You know, you can't wait. Thinking to get down. about it. Yeah, you're always. I'm always studying, like my. My wife, she's like, don't you ever get, like, tired of looking at animals? And I go, never. Nope. <laughs> I, I go home. I watch hunting videos. Because your guys' hunting videos now, they're incredible. I mean, the amount of um, footage that you guys shoot with, you know, with the animals just doing their thing, it's great for learning. I mean, you sit there and you watch them. And now you can freeze frame everything with all the smart televisions mm-hmm. and the, you know, your DVDs. And mm-hmm. it, it's wonderful because I use that a lot for action poses and stuff like that. You sit there and you can s- stop it and just each frame. And you can catch mm-hmm. how their natural movements are. And, and then plus, when you're putting your hands on the actual animal, that's the best. Yeah. So yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm always, always doing it. And when I'm out in the field, you know, I'm always looking at the lichen on the rocks and the moss and just all those little things, what makes the whole piece come together at oh. the, at the end. And I've had tons of people compliment us on that, that it's just not an animal stuck in a couple things of grass or whatever mm-hmm. they go. You, it looks like it's going to walk off that rock or whatever and you know we pride ourselves on that you know you you these animals you wait a lifetime to get them you got to respect them and put everything you can back into it yeah. you know it it you know it that's just how i look at it it's how always it's how i was brought up you know you you give 110 percent of whatever you're doing whether it's taxidermy or whatever you're doing you know you you give it all. Yeah. You no, go halfway. <laughs> yeah, you can definitely tell in your work for sure. What is your favorite thing to mount? Definitely life size. Life size what? Oh, you I've been asked that a lot and that's tough. You know, a big big old muley buck. Right? That's a look that just never gets old. Yeah. But it would be a toss up between a sh- a big old muley and a ram and i would say probably the muley just because there's they're just tougher to get yeah i mean you probably do less life-size uh deer than you do sheep too oh yeah that well i've only done a handful of muleys Mm -hmm. um i did a piece uh this last this is this well actually this year um with that had no actually sorry a year ago now sheesh time flies um, but um, that was the first two big muleys that I've done in a long, long time. And then uh, this year, we got a bunch of life-size muleys in this year. Good. I don't know if it's because they saw those two. Pro- or maybe. There's like, a lot to that. You never know. You're like, yeah. uh, I have this one guy. He's on the fence. He killed a giant buck this year. Uh-huh. And 
he caped at life size. He called me after he killed him. He goes, I just killed a freaking hog. And I'm like, well, right on. And he goes, I, I want a life size. And I'm like, okay. all right. Because he saw the – actually, he did see in person that one buck that I mounted laying down. Uh-huh. And he goes, I want my buck just like that. I'm like, well, we can do it. And he goes, well, how do how do I skin it? So I'm explaining to him while he's over the this, phone. Over right? the phone. <laughs> Well, at least Wait a minute, i got to put you on speaker. I need two hands. <laughs> if he had had FaceTime, he probably could have FaceTimed right? me, but he, he didn't, or he didn't have good enough coverage yeah, or whatever yeah. the deal was. Huh. But, uh, so now he's still on the fence. He goes, I, I don't know if I'm going to pedestal him or life-size him. I have the hide, and I'm like, "Yeah, all right, well, you, whenever you get around to you it. Just keep, send, keep feeding him pictures mm-hmm. of these other ones that you do, exactly. right? Exactly. We could do this habitat behind it, you know. We have a big non-typical that the guy, he he might be life-size in that one. Um, but he, we pedestaled it for him. But he's putting a game room on mm-hmm. uh, in his new home. And now he's he saw those deer. Yeah. He's like, uh, I, I don't know, man. And like yeah. I'm like, we have capes. I mean, that's not a problem. And I go, you don't have to get rid of your pedestal. We can put another set of horns on that pedestal so you don't lose your beautiful pedestal. Right. It was, it was that one that was done on the uh, – I don't know if you saw it on Instagram, the one with the Jack Daniels. I did, yeah. Barrel. Mm-hmm. That's the one he's talking oh, about. Yeah. That's a cool mount. Yeah, it is really cool. It come out. It come just out say, slick. just go kill another big deer. We'll put it in there. That's fine. You're he's good. trying, but <laughs> you know how hard that People is. People get obsessive with their thing. It's like Bill, you know. He kills everything under the sun, and they're all big, and it's all awesome. And he loves every bit of it, but he's, like, so obsessed with the big mule deer. That that's that's like his focus. That's what he wants. Mm-hmm. That's his. He he wants to kill a buck over two hundred so bad. Yeah, uh, he'll get it done. Yeah. Hopefully, I'm there to watch it because we've him and I have known each other a long time, and we've become very very good friends over the years. And he's just he's very passionate about mm-hmm. it. And and his dad is eighty. Yeah. And His dad was in the shop when I was here last yeah, week. I haven't seen Bill. It seems like every time I came here, Bill was here, Bill Jr. His Well, his dad's the one that has – that That was the buck that came in yeah. was his father's. So, huh. And his dad is 80 years old and still still going. Yeah. He killed a nice buck this year, he too. Get a, he got a it nice was, buck. It was, it was here last week. But. It was a, It's a four-pointer with really nice eye guards. Yeah. It was a Mount Rose deer. Yeah, cool deer. Um, hunted almost the whole season. He was a trooper, man. We just – I got to I hunted with him for a week, mm. and had a ball. We were seeing tons of deer, but just looking for that one, you know. Right, and, right. But uh, it's just cool to see. He, you know, he's eighty and he's still out there. You don't see very many guys out there at that age doing that. He's right. in great shape. And my grandfather, unfortunately, he only got to hunt till he was his last hunt was. He was seventy eight. Was, was his, his last la- hunt. last hunt? And he is. We were real, I'll never forget it. We're on the mountain, and my grandpa turned to me, and he goes, this is my last hunt. And Before I, it was over? Before, before it was over. He goes, this is my last hunt. And I'm like, Grandpa, no, I'll push you up here in a wheelchair. I go, there's nothing. I can get you in these little pockets. I go, we'll push the deer to you. You don't even worry about it. But he, w- I think he knew he wasn't, he wasn't feeling good at that point. You hmm. know, and unfortunately, he, he passed away wow. a year later. So, you know, you know. Life isn't a give me, you know. So, right. There's you know, no guarantee that no, nope. you're gonna go. You know when you're gonna go. Right. And I was fortunate to have him as, you know, as yeah. long. He was 80 when he when he passed. He barely turned 80. Hmm. But uh, yeah, it was. I have great memories of that, and um, hmm. hunted with him every year from when I was little to right up to the end. So yeah, oh, that's cool. So That's it's cool. really it means a lot when I, you know, get to hunt with Bill Senior, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, because he reminds me a lot of my grandfather. Mm-hmm. So I, between him and I, or Billy and I, we uh, we watch him like a hawk. And yeah. I mean, he's fine. I mean, he's great. But you know, you just you he's su- you can tell he's a super good man. You know, nice man. When I I met him for the first time last week, mm-hmm. and he came, and I mean, he stood right here. 
and he we were talking and you could tell it's like man there's a sincerity about this guy Mm -hmm. he likes people you know Mm -hmm. he's he just you can just tell when someone is a good person Mm -hmm. and because a lot of people they meet somebody they might stand on the other side of the room or whatever but i mean he was right there and it just it was cool Mm -hmm. you can tell he had a he's had a great hunting career i mean i sit there we'll ride together when we go to ely hunting Mm -hmm. in for deer and uh or wherever we're going right and i just sit and listen to him the stories and the things that he's been able to do um he if don't quote me on this one but i believe he was shot one of the first desert sheep out in mexico really back when they reopened it Hmm. um yeah and he killed a great great ram only unfortunate thing was the film that he documented everything but the film was no good oh wow he has like one snapshot of the whole entire thing and he goes yeah and um he says they just loaded up packs and they didn't have great packs back then right and they goes we had jugs of water and everything he goes we had a it was like you were on safari but we were after a a desert bighorn in Mm -hmm. in mexico and they just took off and wherever they got tired they just plopped down and camped and Hmm. that's my style of hunting right there oh uh, that's the way to go it's the best yeah. it is absolutely the best that's i don't know the more nights i sleep on the ground in the dirt the more i realize yeah maybe a, maybe a base camp or a trailer or a lodge wouldn't be so bad you know they're not bad either <laughs> done them they're they're cool yeah they're good but, but you know i still just have just this hunger to just load up the pack and go and wherever you end up you end up you know i have this dream there's just where i grew up in in idaho there's an access point on this this mountain range, and I just want to get go up that and get on the top, and I just want to head north until I'm done, you know, till I kill something, or until I'm just there, you know, mm-hmm. where you can't, where you're exhausted or your time's spent, and have somebody pick me up. Like I've just always had the dream, even as a kid, I would look at it out the front door and be like, I could start right there, and I could go clear to stinking Mount Bora, you know, just mm-hmm. up and down and just spend spend the entire summer or fall in, in those peaks. But the older I get, the less likely that's going to happen. Ah, <laughs> uh, you're only as old as you think you are. Yeah, I think I'm pretty dang young. I, I <laughs> Exactly. Pretty young. As soon as my kids, you know, as soon as I have, uh, I just love getting home. You know, I love getting home on the weekends and, and spending time with them. So. Well, your boy's getting to the point now. He's going to be. Kids just got to draw a tag. He's 13 now, didn't draw a tag last year or this year. So. Yeah, that's the. That's it's because we're putting part. in close to home. Mm-hmm. You know, we want. He's so active in baseball and flag football and whatever, basketball now. I mean, the kid is so active, scouts, um, that we really need something close to home for him to really experience it. Mm-hmm. So it's that's kind of where we're at. If he doesn't draw again next year, that sucker's coming with me to Idaho or Oklahoma or Texas. wherever I go. Texas. Oh, that hunting. Yeah. Wait, he might be out of school that week. I'll have to check and see. Well, you know, that, Texas, I have to say, Texas – they really get it when it comes to their youth. Yeah. They have so many programs. No for, age limit or it's unreal. It's oh. it's awesome. I I have a friend that lives down there and he goes, Oh shoot, hunting opportunity for your kids is Well, and I used to, you know, there's kind of the pride thing. Mm-hmm. The tendency to look at something and say, Well, that's a landowner tag. That's or that's ah, Texas. It's not. It's not real. It's not legit. But it's like, no, I mean everybody we're all at different stages in our life. We're, it's still hunting. It's not like there's any gimmies. There are some gimmies out there, but that's not hunting. Right. You know? And the, the, as time passes, the, the less negative I look at, at those types of things because it's like, you know what? Well, that guy, he might, he might have spent $10,000 to go on that elk hunt in Montana that I would never do, but I can hunt elk in Idaho, Montana. Colorado and be able to do that because I have the time he might be able to have the $10,000 might be easier for him to come by than a week off of work mm-hmm. and so there's it's good that there's hump opportunities for every different stage every different lifestyle and um, so I guess I kind of knock it a little bit less and Texas is one of those things too that I you looked at and you, you assume well, everything's high fence or everything's it's so easy in Texas because it's all private land or whatever else well it is wild country and you can go down there in these unfenced areas and like I did spend a week 
and not see a single animal, you know. Um, so, I, I Texas Texas is a cool place. Like, I would love to go down there and do more things. And even exotics, I think, for me, I would rather go to Texas and shoot something, some, an African animal, than to go to Africa and shoot the African animal because it's probably a harder hunt, you know. You never know. You I go mean, to Africa and sit in these, these huts underneath, and then, again, I'm stereotyping Africa, but, like, the experience experiences that i've heard from friends and that to go to africa i mean it's posh you stay in the lodge you sit in the it's it's an experience i want to do yeah because i i we do a lot of african work um it's a total different it's it's just a whole different ball game it's a I killing mean, mission is what it is well it's a target rich <laughs> environment yeah i personally have never been there me neither yeah. but um you know it's one that's on the list but the guys that i do work for they said oh it it's incredible. You can hunt as hard as you want, mm -hmm. or you can do it as easy as you want, you know, which really works nice for people that are getting up there in age that can't, mm -hmm. you know, we're still young. We can get up and get up the mountains and hunt sheep and stuff like that. But, you know, when you hit your mm -hmm. late 60s and stuff like that, your old feet don't go like they used to. and <laughs> Well, that's what I told my wife. She says, well, why don't you go to Africa with Riley or some of them? Some of my, I, I, get, I have friends that go and do things all over, and I'm like, well, I could do that when I'm old. You know, I can hop on a plane. I can go sit in a blind. I mean, I, I think that I will be a whitetail hunting sucker in my older age because I love the passive style of hunting. I love the ambush style, you mm -hmm. know, and you figure that out. And... It's, it's really cool that there is such a wide variety of hunting techniques that mm -hmm. people can take part of. And we just hope th that we can all work hard enough to, so that that continues, you know, mm -hmm. do what we can to champion hunting in a good light and in a way that is palatable to those that are non-hunters looking at it and saying, you know, I can accept that. Mm -hmm. um, well, did you, it's interesting you brought that up because, um, you know, you you hear California and you you think of all the antis and the weirdos and stuff like that. And I have a really good client that's down there in, in California, and he he likes hunting everything. Actually, his whole family does, and he has all girls. They all hunt. His wife hunts. Um, but we we were setting up their game room, and I didn't have a covered truck. You know, we have this big stuff. It's hard to put big things when you got a camper right. shell and stuff. So we had the trailer, and we had the back end of the U-Haul truck that we rented, and we were just packing it full of mounts and hauling it to his game room. And people, I'm thinking, oh, my Lord, we're going to have paint thrown on us. I, yeah, I didn't know what yeah. to expect. It was amazing how many thumbs-ups we, we were getting. Uh, we were right on the main drag yeah, yeah. of this busy road. People are like thumbing up, you know. Yeah, you know, we had this. There's a lot of rednecks in California, oh, man. But we were down there and way down south, yeah. so I was like, you know, didn't yeah. I didn't know what to expect. People were overwhelmingly supportive. I was, and we had, I was carrying a full on lion, you know, yeah. down the sidewalk. And we had ivory, and I've just there's some real yeah, yeah. critical, you know, not critical. It's a big political thing now yeah. with ivory and with yeah. Cecil the lion and everything. It just you think that when it gets when it hits the taxidermy stage, like its its soul is almost gone. Like mm -hmm. people's separation between that was a live animal to that. There's there's a little bit gone there. Now let's say let's say you're driving down the road and you've got a big buck draped across to your the back of your truck or whatever. Do you think that's as acceptable as? No, <laughs> uh, we don't. Well, you know, as a kid, I loved hunt. Come October, you're oh, looking in the back of truck beds oh, just, every day. Yeah. Like, hey, we're that? headed out going hunting. We're just looking for horns, you know. And yeah. I personally, I still love seeing it. Yeah, but me too. Anymore, we don't we don't show nothing. Yeah. We we hide we we drape it, you know, with canvas and yeah. Have everything broke down and did nothing. You don't even. The only way you know we are hunting is you can tell there's mud on the truck and there's a trailer on the back yep. end, you know, and it's got yep. gear in it. But yeah, I don't think that there's there's just. I've seen a couple of videos on Instagram that were somebody had a one of the the bumper hitch hanging things and the deer's hung hung there and they're driving down the freeway or the road, and I I was like, you know, who's 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 worse here? The guy that is doing that, taking it home so that you can skin it out. 
or the guy that's filming it on his phone and then broadcasting it to the world. I'm like, who's doing more harm? Well, it's the guy filming it and broadcasting it to the world for the shock factor of it. Mm-hmm. If he'd have just left that guy alone, dozen people see it, but now millions of people see it. You mm-hmm. know, We just have to realize that the people that are watching aren't all hunters no. and want to see that. Because of the way social media is, we're all quote-unquote public figures, whether our popularity level, wherever it is or not. But we're showing... We're showing so many things to people that just aren't ready for it. The client that's in California, he loves to hunt elephant. He's taken a lot of elephant, and he's documented every one. And I've watched the video, and it's, it sheds a whole nother light. I mean, when that animal hit the ground, he goes, you won't believe this. And he's playing it on the video, and pretty soon one woman shows up. Then another one. And actually, you know, you have like a whole village and they all have pots. The women bring water to trade. And I, I was, it was unbelievable. When they were done, there was just a blood spot. They took the bones. The bone, everything. They the took cartilage. everything. The guts. They don't let, no, I mean, they literally don't let nothing go. And I was, it was, it it shed a lot of light on on stuff and then the animals that they're you just you know when we draw a deer tag or whatever we just go and we hunt a deer you know you might have a buck that you're after but majority of the people they just go and they shoot a deer you know that's a nice buck whack that's not the case when they're hunting uh the elephants or uh, over in africa it's it's different Mm -hmm. they those trackers are so good over there they have a certain animal they want to take out of the herd that's the one they hunt and that's the one you will shoot you might have a legal bull nope that's not the one causing the problems that we know the bull that's causing the problems or the lion or whatever and i don't know how they do it but those trackers i've he he videos it you know and Mm -hmm. he actually has a a professional videographer come and and document everything and i mean he's he's put it together a uh, an incredible video on on elephant hunting and what goes into it and why and where the money goes and all that and he gives back to the communities there and it just it it i wish mainstream would pick that up and with an open mind look yeah. at that and say oh okay they're not just out there waste laying waste to elephants mm-hmm they're hunting certain ones that are causing problems like he goes he goes this he he harvests this this one elephant it had come in it kept raiding their fields well those people they grew that crop for to get them through the winter for for the village well the elephant ate it all Hmm. he goes now they don't have the food to get them through the winter and he the kids are crying i mean it's not staged. It's, it's life and death. It's this life is... and death. And now, so he paid a good chunk of change to harvest that bull elephant. Which you could look at as a humanitarian effort. Right. And so they they harvested that elephant, and all that meat went back to that village. Plus the money, a lot of that money went back into that village. Um, it's It's just a lot bigger picture than yeah. going and killing Because locals elephant. can't kill the animals. I don't think they're allowed to, other than the poaching well, they, or whatever. They, they poach. The poaching is horrendous, but um, they, uh, they, they, they are allowed a quota, and that's what they've been going to. I've, you know, I don't know if you've watched Carter's. I love Carter's War. Yeah, yeah. It, it's an excellent, excellent show. Phenomenal. Um, and they're shedding light on what's going on on the ground over there. And mm-hmm. I, they're in a war over there. Mm-hmm. And I'm afraid if they don't, you know, b- put a stop, be able to put a stop to it. I mean, there's a good possibility. I'm, will we see, like, rhinos go away? Yeah. I mean, yeah, well, yeah, it's possible. It's sickening to think it, that. People don't realize that it's the, it's the market hunting that is keeping these species around. Mm-hmm. Without the market hunting... The poaching, the, the the 
exposure to the poaching and what's going on isn't there. And the animals don't have value anymore. Nope. And if they're not valuable to hunters in the hunting community, then the only value they have is to the poachers. Mm-hmm. And um, then there's going to be nobody to protect them. Like it's it's really weird by hunting an animal and by managing it and killing a few so that more can survive and putting a light to it and putting a value to them. You're 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 giving the species a chance, giving them an ability to to thrive. Look at the bighorn sheep in Nevada. You know, not very many years ago. I mean, we're young men, but not very long before we came around, there weren't any sheep. No, very few. Um, and now in such a small, just a few generations, there's a, a very huntable population of sheep in almost every mountain range in Nevada. Yeah. I think we have right now that they, I think the biologists, they are estimation that we have right around 11,000 yeah. sheep. If those elephants in those villages don't have a monetary value for your, your friend to come in and spend X number of dollars to come in and kill that elephant, if there's no value there. What's to stop the locals from just saying, oh, let's go kill that elephant. And while we're at it, let's kill his buddies and everything else, too, because pro- chances are they're going to come and destroy the neighbor's crop. Mm-hmm. So they're going to kill them all. Um, yeah, they get the meat and everything from it, but if they're not managed, you have a whole nation of poachers out there, whether they're doing it for the monetary gain of selling the ivories and the bones and whatever else, or they're doing it just for survival. There is there is a difference, but it's very small. I mean, it's still, it's still poaching. Yep. Um, so it's... It's a it's a weird thing. We're never going to convince everyone that hunting is okay. No. Nope. And you know, I just the only thing that we can do is be okay with hunting ourselves mm-hmm. and show it in a light that is, like I say, more palatable to to the non-hunter. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I don't I don't know what the best answer is for that. You know. If you figure it out, let me know. <laughs> um, well, out of sight, out of mind. In a lot yeah. of ways, you know. Oh. Quit, I've had, we've had death threats. Yeah. Um, I mean, you get some people that are real belliger- belligerent on the, on social media. Yeah. And it is, well, the Medal of Honor, you know, every time I get a death threat, I'm like, mm. yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> well, like you say, we're such a small community as it is anyway that it's not, uh, yeah. Yeah, you just know. blow it off. It's that people like that, you just, they're, fu- I, they're I gonna, think, I think they're, a, real small number anyways that are radical like They're smaller that. than we are mm-hmm. yeah but cool yeah. well wayne i appreciate it um thank you very much for the time thank uh, you very I much learned, it learned a lot, a lot and i i've it's funny like known you for years and every time i come in here i, I have to spend at least an hour or two and we just chit chat and mm-hmm. talk about things and then once this podcast came along it was just natural for me i'm like oh i gotta go we got to go sit down with Wayne and talk about things. So, A lot of fun. So. This will be fun. we got to do it again. Heck yeah. Hey, big thanks to you guys for tuning in to this episode of the podcast. We really appreciate your continued support that you've shown to Remy and I over the years. Your support does not go unnoticed. For more information on the Solo Hunter TV show, branded merchandise, and other great hunting gear that we make, head over to solohunter.com, that's solohntr.com, where you can check out photos and videos from the Solo Nation. And if you feel like it, purchase the All Access Membership, where you get unlimited access to our complete digital video library of episodes and web-exclusive films. You also get an unlimited 20% discount on all purchases of Solo Hunter merchandise and automatic entry into amazing product and hunt giveaways. Again, we really appreciate you for being here, and I look forward to meeting with and talking with you again soon.